Hi, my name's Keith Cooper, North Flight Images. Um, I did a video the other day that looked at this particular picture. It's a picture of a beach in Suffolk at Shingle Street and why it's important to me, how it affected some of my photography and how it has lasting effects today. But uh, in this video, I'm going to look at some of the aspects of processing this imaging image, mounting it, printing it and various things like that. So this is a, a more technical how one. The, the other video was the why, uh, that it's a, a scene that means quite a lot to me. It signifies a lot of things and it, how it's influenced my photography and going ongoing way uh, still influences it today. From a technical point of view, this image was one of the key ones that got my interest in digital black and white started, initially as a way of digitally printing black and white images and then quite quickly into processing digital images uh, which are taken on most cameras as colour images, converting them. I've got lots of stuff about black and white. Um, I've got There's a playlist devoted to black and white. I'll put some more things, uh, some links in the notes here. But really this particular image, um, it was and it was taken on Olympus OM-2 and the film I now know was FP4. I've checked since the last, uh, since the last video and it was shot um, using 24 millimeter lens, the same lens that I'm using for filming this today, uh, Olympus uh, 24 mil f2.8 Zoico lens. It had a very light orange filter on it, which covers some of the, it's brought the detail out a bit more in the sky. So I'm going to have a look at some of the details of this, uh, scanning, uh, processing the imaging, editing it, sh including sharpening, and then printing how I went about printing. Now, all of these aspects continue to influence every bit of my photography, even the colour photography, because what I learned about producing a good version of this has benefited me ever since. I did this using Photoshop many years ago, 20, 25 years ago, uh, so an old version of Photoshop. If I was to use Photoshop to process it today, I would use almost exactly the same tools that I used then. Um, this is such a basic level of image processing that you do not need the latest version of Photoshop or anything like that. Um, Lightroom, I haven't a clue, never liked it much since it started. So I'll just, I'll leave it at that and just say that I much prefer Photoshop, partly because I've used it for so long and I understand curves and blending layers and things like that. You don't need that much for this. I'll show something about a curve adjustment, but in general, this is a very simply processed image. The lens, well, it's okay. Um, that's why I'm using it here. Now it's manual focus, uh, manual aperture setting. Uh, but the actual image that was taken, and this is from a scan of it, 35 mil, you can see obviously the aspect ratio is quite different between this. In fact, when I look at the original image, and this is one of the scans, and I'll talk about some scanning in a bit, um, I can see quite a bit of vignetting in the corners, um, quite a bit of darkening still there on that, but the corner in this, because this is a crop, is not, uh, is not visible. I can also see that I didn't even get the horizon quite level. So uh, there was quite a bit of work. But this picture was one that I'd initially printed in the darkroom, wasn't greatly impressed by it. Now, that's more telling on my darkroom skills than necessarily the photography for it, but it, was, it felt fairly ordinary. And it's about how I went to produce this. And I'll talk about some of the versions I've produced of this and why I produce different versions, paper choices and things like that. But anyway, the full version of it, first of all, it needed scanning. Now at the time I had, and I've still got in a drawer here somewhere, Canon FS4000 film scanner. Um, it's a box like this, takes a row of film, takes it in, goes through, scans it, really quite high resolution, 4,000 uh, 4, pixels per inch. So it's fairly good. Um, there are better these days and certainly higher end. And I'll, I'll come back to higher end scanning in a bit, which you might consider if you want to make more of a particular image that you've got. But as I said, this was um, 1987 or thereabouts. There's my three and a half litre V8 Rover sitting in the background there, uh, which I can actually see the shape from the shape of it, what the car was, uh, quite a nice car to drive around in. And as I say, this is the original. 
So in terms of scanning it, as I, I used just an ordinary film scanner at the time, but I have actually, and I'll put a link to an article of this, um, somebody who uh, read a discussion when I was looking at doing a review of the Epson V850 scanner, I mentioned something about this and someone offered in Sweden, and I put links there in, in the article there, uh, to do some drum scans using an Imacon and a, an Epson V750 as well as the 850 I'd tested. So I've got quite a lot of scans of this. These happened years after I did, you know, uh, took the picture. These are only uh, you know less than ten years ago. Uh, the the scans. This this particular image here is from a lot longer. This is this is years old. This is done with the Canon FS four thousand. But anyway, uh, in looking at scanners, um, the drum scan, which is supposed you know the Rolls Royce one, oil mounted, everything that. The detail in that is incredible in terms of picking up the grain. Um, is it the best looking scan? Maybe, maybe not. I mean, if I look at another one, here's the V850. Now, the difference between that is, is quite obvious. And the V850 and V750 do need care in getting the focus right. Uh, also, even on the FS4000, I used to check this and stuff because film has a habit of popping and moving when it's in mounts, uh, unless it's you know, securely mounted. So you do have to be careful with this when you're scanning. But you know, far more people are getting into film scanning these days. Um, well, yeah, more people are getting into it. The numbers of people who used to do it were far greater, but then that's all to do with film coming back as a very much niche thing. Yes, it gets a lot of column inches in magazines and the likes, but that's because there's shorter material to talk about as much as anything. And you know, the resurgence of film, you can guarantee, is a dead cert if you're an article writer for something, you can write about the resurgence of film every six months and you'll have a few subtle changes. You can add to your article to say how great it is. Now, I've been there, done that, I liked it. I got a lot from it. Do I want to use film again? No, thank you. I really don't want to. I have no interest in it. Um, but I still say that if you get a chance, use it because it's different and you might find you like it. Um, it's far more expensive these days than it ever was when I used to play around with film when I was at school. Uh, it was much cheaper then. But anyway, that's that V850. The V750 is slightly softer and now is my four FS4000 view. Um, that's at 4000 uh, 4, pixels per inch. Yeah, it's okay. That's the one I used for this. And now, which is probably the best in terms of ability to work on the file. Sometimes you know, the file can have too, too much sharp detail of the wrong sort. What do I mean the wrong sort? Well, I, w I don't necessarily want to emphasize the grain too much. Now, if you've got things like an Imacon scanner and or a drum scanner, there are lots of different settings you can um, use to get the best from any particular negative. And that would depend on how the negative was processed, how it was exposed, and the film type, obviously, the film make, the, yeah, the, the particular vari variant of film. So the Imacon image is probably the easiest to work on because the grain is real that you can see in it. The grain is there, but it's not quite as pronounced as it was in the drum scan. Now, a lot of this is just to do with sharpening and settings and things like that. So I won't go into it too much more other than to say you can get some pretty good detail from film. You can have a setup where you use a camera to take photographs of it. There's all kinds of ways of doing that. But anyway, so that's, I've got my image. Now, what do I want to do with it? Well. The first thing, well, the first thing I did this was print it normally, but it was when I started approaching it digitally that I decided to crop it. And that's where I put the horizon really low down here, uh, got rid of all the foreground, all the, uh, all the shingle, got rid of that, gave much more prominence to the sky, uh, prominence to the shape of the building, the shape of the clouds, the contrast between the dark and light areas. I'd love to say I th looked at this and thought about this in terms of detailed composition of the clouds and everything like that. No, it was pure luck that that day happened to be some cloud that really worked. I've taken pictures of the scene uh, other times and I can see how much I benefited from the particular arrangement of cloud that day. Just accept it that sometimes, you know, what's there is good. 
Um, it was, of course, handheld because there was absolutely no way I had a tripod with me on a beach like this uh, walking around. Probably why the horizon's a little bit on the skew, but that doesn't matter. You know, I fixed that when I, you know, when I cropped it. I like this wider view crop. It seems to work. We've got, in terms of the image, in terms of editing it, once I've got the scan in, I want to make sure that the blackest blacks just touch on black and the white bits, because it's a well exposed image, um, I want maybe just a tiny bit of detail even in that whitest bit of cloud over there. It's very close to pure white but there is very faint detail in it. Similarly the darkest part of the image is probably the doorway here or some of the bits to the side of the building. Um, but that's a simple adjustment of setting levels and that's how I've processed it once I've got the image in from the, from the scans. So I did similarly when I had all those other sample scans and had a look at it. So I've got that uh, for this one, I believe, because this was the FS4000, I've rescaled it slightly. Now I've used um, simple rescaling, haven't used any of the smart upscaling that I would use these days. I've noticed things that Gigapixel AI, which I would happily apply to many digital images, is designed for digital images. It's not necessarily that great when it comes to upscaling detail in film. It hasn't obviously been trained much on rescaling film images and it shows. Um, the, the grain can be handled very unevenly depending on whether the, uh, the, you know, the software thinks it's noise or whether it thinks it's fine image detail. Um, it has, you know, modern software tends to have problems with this which is why I go back to the basics and do just basic resampling in Photoshop. What do I do in terms of sharpening? Well, I might do a little you know, for, for print. I'm going to sharpen it because I want to, there's quite obvious grain in this picture and because I want to keep the grain in it. Um, I can do some fine detail sharpening. That's fine. I can do some unsharp mask uh, sharpening there. I can also do a little bit of high radius, low amount shading, um, sharpening or higher loam as it was called. Um, that's the settings in the Photoshop sharpening dialog. I do all of these on layers so that I can blend them and adjust the amount. Because like with most adjustments in Photoshop I find it's far easier to overdo the adjustment and then knock it back to what you want rather than try and get it to just the point you want just in the initial setting. So you overdo it, you see what you don't want, then you bring it back to get it. So that governs the amount, of, um, the amount of grain that's visible on here. It's an amount I'm happy with. You know, it's to your taste, whatever you do on it. Uh, the sky is quite dark at the top here, because as I say, I had a light orange filter on. Um, so it's definitely it's brought out the cloud detail very nicely. There is a bit of vignetting, as I say, from, from it towards the edges, but certainly in the top corners here, bottom corners have been cropped out, but they're just more shingle. Did I do anything else? Yes, I went through and cleaned up the shingle um, because there were one or two marks on it and you get there was some dust spots and various things. So I just made sure that uh, the shingle looks like shingle, that it doesn't look like any unnatural artifacts have crept into it or bits of you know, dust or other problems with it. But so I end up with an image that I'm happy with that's cropped from the other one and it's a matter then of how I'm going to print it. Now, this image was one of many that helped me get into black and white printing. And at the time when I first printed this, I printed a large version of this on an Epson uh, 9600. I used the image print rip, the black and white print mode, printed it on a cotton rag paper and it looked very nice and then had it laminated and put on a, uh, put on a wall for an exhibition. Uh, this particular paper here uh, is a plain matte art paper. It's not a thick rag paper, uh, it's just a plain art paper. This one was, this particular one was printed I think probably on the 9600 but this is quite an old print. Um, if I was printing these days I would want a printer with a black and white print mode, something like the P5000 here. This would print a 17 inch width version of it, so slightly less than this. This is slightly bigger than would print on that particular printer there. I'd use the black and white. Now one of the things I learned from you know, handling these images was that printers, even with good black and white print modes, and they have got better over recent years, that printers on some papers can be slightly non-linear. 
this, this image and a few others led to me developing my black and white test image. Now I've got loads of stuff on that. I'll put links in the notes if you're interested in this. But the black and white test image, one of the reasons for doing that was measuring print linearity. So to find out were shadows being crunched up, were highlights being lost, uh, all the sorts of things that you don't normally notice. Um, if I'm editing on a well calibrated setup monitor, even for black and white, calibrate your monitors and set them up. If I'm editing on that and I then want to do a, a print of it, I'm much happier because I know this is right. If I know I linearized the black and white output. Now I've got aspects covering this. Every review, printer review I do, if the printer is capable of even moderately good black and white, I will have a section on linearization and how well it performs. So I've got lots of stuff on that and details about how to process it. But yeah, this is I, what did I adjust for this one? Well, the natural, the paper I printed it on, um, I ended up using an adjustment curve um, that based on my measurements. And I said, I've got lots of details of how to do this sort of stuff. But what I was really worried about was that the print as was uh, tended to crunch up the shadows, the dark here. So I'd lost this, this turned to solid black. It also, the mid-tones were a little bit, um, they were a little bit too light, so darkened the mid-tones. So we lightened the shadows. This is done by a simple adjustment curve. One simple adjustment curve in Photoshop that you just nudge to the right shape and do that before you do any printing. So I've got that done. Um, I've got everything set up for printing light and then I just print it. Um, there's nothing special about it. This is really quite a, a, a simple image to process. You know, the, a good, it helps to have a well exposed negative, a good scan, get your levels right, get your, your, your general look and tonal balance the way you want it, get it to the size you want, do a bit of sharpening. You might do a bit of um, sharpening to emphasize local contrast, but be careful with stuff like that because I wanted this to look like something I could have printed in the darkroom if my skills had been high enough for, to be able to do it. Um, you also decide on your papers and that just how black you want it. Now, this is quite a light image. Um, even the blacks here are not that black. I printed it on a matte paper. And that's because I've printed this on glossy papers uh, or luster paper, like say the uh, cathedral shot in the background here. And having these areas too dark looks wrong. Um, this is a daylight image. Um, I am not out to get the utmost, utmost blacks in it. I want an image that I feel works and that's what this one does. So that's it, print it. Now I've printed it, how to display it. Just a quick bit here, People, uh, quite a few people have asked me how I display pictures. Now this frame, this is a wooden frame with a metallic paint on it. Uh, this frame was made by a local frame making company. Now they're a commercial company that makes picture frames. So what I got off them, um, and I had a whole load of them done. And, and, yeah, if you buy a lot, you get it a bit cheaper and quite a bit cheaper in this case. Um, I have the wooden frame here. There's a backing board and I have a mat board. Now the mat board here, you'll see has a cutout in it to match this picture. Since it's an arbitrary crop and I just cropped it because this is the way I want it and it printed at this size just to fit in, you know, to work well on this, I've had to, cut the mat. Now I've got a very simple mat cutter here and this has a uh, razor blade in it that is angled and you put this on, you set things up, you run this along and it will do, it will cut your mat. It means I've still got loads of sheets of cardboard with beveled edges that are the cutouts from the middle of these um, somewhere. I'm never short of bits of cardboard but this one has been, I've made the mat. Now the print, the, the, the frame, the backing, everything else, that I've all got. You stick the print, it's just attached at the top with museum grade tape, uh, so it's hanging free. Um, you have to be a bit careful when I moved this one so that the tape had obviously dried a bit, so it, it had dropped a bit when I moved it. This has been hanging up for, for ages somewhere, so um, yeah, hence why I need to give it a bit of a clean when I put it back. But there we go, basic framing. Um, it's easy enough to do. I got one of these, this, this cutter here, and let's say there's a guide rail and the actual blade slides along it. Big sheet of cardboard for the base for it. Cut this out, it takes a few minutes. 
if you're going to do it, be very careful measuring the size of the cutout and marking it because um, you want to do it cleanly. You want to handle the corners properly. Yeah, it needs a bit of practice. So don't practice on bits of cardboard this size. If you come by one of these, and I got this from when a um, you know, an art supply shop was shutting down. Um, got this, they're, they're relatively expensive, but um, I got this for about 15, 20 quid, uh, which is gr a real bargain for it. I got it years, I've used it loads of times. I don't normally offer framed matted prints because if I'm going to get this done, I get it done professionally by, the, say, the company that makes these. Uh, but you will find if you look round, there are all kinds of small companies doing things like framing and making stuff like this. Uh, but this was actual wholesalers who make these frames. So I was able to get a, you know, a bulk load of them. And I've got quite a few prints printed with this. So there we go. There's the picture that changed things. This is one of the pictures that really got me into digital black and white, hence all the articles and stuff I've done, all the testing I've done, all the printer testing. But more importantly, this is a picture that changed some of my attitudes to taking pictures, to composition, and it's really the picture that first got me into appreciating what you could do digitally and realising that for me, film was something I did in the past. Um, your mileage may vary, but that is quite an important image to me and one I really like. But I cover that in the other in the uh, in the other video. So hope that's of some interest. If you've got questions, please feel free to ask. It's it's people's questions about things that give me the idea. Uh, please subscribe to the channel if you find it useful. Uh, so if you want more ones like this, just let me know um, or questions as I say. But uh, thanks for watching and um, I hope you found it useful. Thank you.